Hello and welcome to the first of the Higher Grounds Conversations. My guest in this conversation is philosopher, a writer, a teacher, and a Catholic priest, Father Sebastian Walsh of St. Michael's Abbey in Orange County, California. He was in town and here in this undisclosed locale of beautiful Minnesota, we got to talk a bit about his background, how his passion for philosophy began, but mostly about the relationship between philosophy and faith and him being a theologian as well as a philosopher. These are topics that Father Sebastian has studied and considered a great deal. And I hope many of you will find his insights instructive and helpful. I know I sure did. But before we start, please, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and click the bell so you can be notified when new conversations like this one are available. My hope is that they can be a small aid to those who are honestly pursuing the truth wherever it lies and want to rise above the prejudice and emotions of our own times and consider the truth more profoundly than we modern people are accustomed to on higher grounds, as it were. Also, check out my blog for more articles and related information. And feel free to leave a comment or question, and I'll try to address them as soon as I can. So, enough of that. Enjoy this Higher Grounds conversation, and thanks. And we're live. Father Sebastian Walsh, welcome to the Higher Grounds. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. <gasps> oh, it's uh, truly an honor to have you here. In this undisclosed location which is very warm and humid but <laughs> glad you were able to take some time for us um, so uh, today I was hoping we could talk about uh, philosophy and faith and you being a philosopher and a Catholic priest as well seemed really apropos uh, subject for our conversation this this maiden voyage conversation for uh, the higher grounds so I'm sure I'm gonna make all kinds of <laughs> interviewer uh, faux pas but I'll do the best I can <laughs> I think um, it'll be great. I'm looking forward to <laughs> well, it. Well, thanks. So, <coughs> you and I, we've known each other for a long time. Over 10 years now, I just realized I, I was getting ready for this. Closer to 13 or 14 now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, it's been a huge blessing in my life. Thank you. Um, but for those of you, uh, or those of the people watching who, who don't know much about you, could you tell us a bit about yourself? How did sure. your interest in philosophy begin? Um, and, and what you're up to these days? Yes. So, um, I can't say I was interested in philosophy from the beginning, um, other than my nature was inclined to it, as everyone's is. Um, but at some point, when I was a, um, a young man in college, I was doing engineering, electrical engineering. And, and engineering is one of those things that's very practical, but at the same time very systematic, and there's a lot of thinking involved. And so there was a kind of rigor in the classes I took, and I appreciated those things. But, um, but I never suspected that that kind of rigorous approach to understanding practical matters could actually be applied also to more speculative matters, you know, looking at just the causes of reality. And um, a friend of mine's father recommended a book called uh, The Constellation of Philosophy by Boethius. And I happened to be on summer break. My, uh, my brother and I were up in uh, Saskatchewan, southern Saskatchewan, in a place called Kenosi Lake in the Moose Jaw Mountains. And we stayed there for about a week, and and each morning I would go down to the lake, to Genosi Lake, and dangle my feet off a little pier there and read a few pages of Boethius' Constellation of Philosophy. And what struck me was that, that in wrestling with the same problems that Boethius was wrestling with, you know, things like, what is time? What is good? What is evil? You know, these sort of questions, that... Uh -huh. that my own attempts to solve those problems approximated or moved in the same direction as the, the, the answers Boethius gave. Mm -hmm. But he was able to give the same answers, but in a much more clear and, um, and accurate and rigorous way. And it struck me that I was able independently from consulting my experience to come to a similar position, which for the first time made me suspect there might be something really objective in philosophy. In other words, um, it wasn't just an accident that the two of us came up with similar responses to the same problems. Huh? And you were just an engineer at this point, right? Or, yeah, I, I was say just an engineer, a, but a student of engineering. I was about 19 years old. It was between, I think, my junior and senior year of college. Okay, so electrical engineering. And yeah. um, do you have a, a like a brief example of the kind of thing you're thinking of that yeah, uh, kind I, of converged with with yeah. Boethius? I remember when I was thinking about well, the nature of evil, and I approached evil through the idea of the true and the false. I realized um, just as there is only one way to be true, but many ways to be false, 
Hmm. In the same way, there's only one way to be good and many ways to be evil. Evil really has a, a parasitical existence. Huh? Hmm. That um, if you had to define falsehood, it would be a departure from the truth. But truth can be understood in itself and something similar with goodness. That um, goodness can be understood in itself, but evil can only be understood in reference or relatively to goodness, of falling away from goodness. So that analogy between truth and falsity and goodness and evil was something I had sort of worked through and, and I saw something like that in Boethus's approach to his understanding of evil and also the nature of good. So that's an example. That's great. There you go. So that's how I first got interested in philosophy and by the time that summer was over I really felt a deep um, appreciation, interest, longing. Yeah. I also started reading um, some books by C.S. Lewis. He's a very um, convincing apologist and he, he applies rational methods to religion, mm. to understanding our faith. And he does it very well, and he does it in a way that's, that has some real rigor to it. Huh? And so I became convinced that there really was a way to understand reality and also faith in a, in a rational way that, that wasn't just a subjective, how do I feel about these things and my approach or my ideas, but there was really a contact with reality that, that, um, that uh, allowed you to arrive at some real certain knowledge about how things are, um, not only at the level of um, of the world, the sensible world around us, but even things beyond that. Sure. So that was where the spark began. Mm -hmm. So what did you do after that? You finished your degree as an electrical finished my engineer, degree, degree as an electrical engineer. Went off and worked at a wonderful place, a patent law firm in Newport Beach. I had a great job, wonderful, <laughs> you know, big desk and leather furniture and a view of the Pacific Ocean, and and essentially I had everything that life told me I was supposed to have, hmm. and I had it right away. You know, this is like, this is the perfect life. And, and what I found was that even though I woke up every morning looking forward going to work, I thought to myself, this can't be all there is to life. I had a subjective sense that, that human happiness and fulfillment couldn't come from success monetary success or success from the standpoint of a, a job or even of you know being able to to go and do and see certain things or whatever traveling none of those things seem to be um, really closely tied to human fulfillment hmm. and and I remembered my experience in seeking to know truth and reading Boethius and other things and I thought those are the times when I, I had the experience of being feeling most fulfilled and I realized that human happiness and fulfillment seems to be somehow tied to the life of the mind. And, um, and that was when I really started thinking again about my, you know, my education. I realized at that point I had a job training, but not an education. Hmm. And, uh, and I decided to go to Thomas Aquinas College at that point where I had known some, um, some people, this friend of mine's father who gave me that book, The Constellation of Philosophy, he had sent his children to Thomas Aquinas. And, um, and I realized that was the sort of place I could get the education, the life of the mind that I, that I realized was necessary for human fulfillment. And you found that to be true? Absolutely. Yeah. How did you go from there to being a, uh, a Catholic priest with the Norbertines? Yeah, well, I don't know if that's a longer or shorter story, but I'll give you the short version of sure. it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I graduated from Thomas Aquinas College. My intention was to marry and have children, as many graduates from the college do. It seems to be <laughs> the, the most frequently chosen occupation of graduates from the college. And, um, and I was actually off uh, studying philosophy at Catholic University. My intention was to get a doctorate and then to come back and teach at Thomas Aquinas. In the meantime, hopefully run into someone who'd be a you know, perfect spouse and <laughs> we could have a family together. But when I was out there at Catholic University, I got to be close friends with a man who's a seminarian from the, uh, the Diocese of Raleigh, North Carolina. He's now a priest there, Father Tim Mears. And um, that relationship, that friendship, um, was really the opening for the possibility of a vocation for me. Aristotle says that a friend is like another self. And, and when you have a friend as another self, their good becomes your good. And really for the first time I could see a priestly vocation through the eyes of someone who saw it as a good f for me and and something which which was um, you know not only a good for the church but also something that that would be fulfilling for me 
And I thought um, that would be a good thing if I could do it. I didn't know if I could do it, but I thought if I could do it, it would be a good thing for me. And I believed that it was possible that I could be happy in that situation, which before those thoughts of a vocation which had occasionally entered my mind, they just, it wasn't really possible yet at the time because I just didn't have the sense that I could really, really be happy in a mm. vocation like that. So, um, to finish the story, I went, I made a come and see visit at the Abbey. I really didn't know much about the Abbey. I really had two criteria, and I wanted to see that they were uh, faithful to the magisterium and serious about holiness. Those are my only two criterion for a, for a place. I was only going to give God one chance. I wasn't really <laughs> going to pursue this, you know, with vigor or anything. I just thought, well, if this is what God wants me to do, then I'll give him one shot. If it doesn't work out, then I'll take my vocation to be married, and that'll be that. So I went to the Abbey. I made a come and see visit <clears throat> a couple weeks and um, decided to enter. And then once I entered, God gave me the grace to stay. From that point on, I've been a very happy man. As you know, in the 13 years you've known me. You've known I can me. attest, you yes. You've known that I've been a happy man at peace with God's will for me and uh, certainly joyful that God chose me to be a priest. So.